what is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. Um, <clears throat> good evening. My name is Kristen Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Yep. I'm this meeting of the board to order. I confirm that members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. John O'Rourke. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Revelak. Here. Excellent. On um, behalf of the town, Rick Valorelli. Here. Vincent Lee. Here. And Kelly Linema. Here. All. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The consultants, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And uh, I don't believe Marty is on this evening, but I saw Greg Lucas is on and uh, Laura Krause is here as well, both from Beta. So good to see you both. Um, I believe that Bill McGrath is supposed to be joining from Beta as well. I don't know if he's in your list of attendees. Uh, okay. Also with us today, Mr. Chairman, is uh, Tyler DeRuder, who was involved in the traffic review with Beta. Oh, Brian. Good, okay. good evening. Nice to meet you. Good evening. Nice to meet you as well. And then on behalf of the, um, <clears throat> the applicant, um, Mary O'Connor. And Mary, if you could uh, run down the list of who is with you this evening. Uh, Daniel St. Clair from Spalding and Sly. Uh, Randy Marin from Bowler Engineering. Uh, let's see, we have Brian Zamolka from Niche Engineering. Joel Bargman from BKNA. Um, uh, Julia Myrak. Uh, Paul Boucher. And I think that's it. Uh, those are all who've signed on. Perfect. He's at with LaSalle Jones. Okay. Thank you all for joining us this evening and thanks to the members of the public for joining us as well. Um, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and that it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer, audio, or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials have been provided by members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. So moving to the first item on our agenda this evening. Um, is the public hearing continuation on the comprehensive permit for 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. This evening's discussion will focus on revised materials from the applicant and from uh, review materials from beta group. We will open with a presentation by the applicant followed by questions from the board. After the board members of the public will be invited to provide their questions and comments. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ms. O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good evening. Before I begin with a brief outline of um, the pres presenters tonight, I just wanna thank um, the Zoning Board of Appeals and the various town departments for all of their work and effort on behalf of this project. Uh, I particularly wanna also thank the neighbors um, who worked with us in a cooperative manner and I think it was productive. But we, we are very, and beta, and beta was very helpful. Uh, I'm pleased to report that my client and the Conservation Commission have reached agreement as to the relocation of 
Ryder Brook uh, and a substantial enhancement of what will be the new relocated Ryder Brook. And I believe you have a letter from a chair of the Conservation Commission, Susan Chapnick, as to that issue. Uh, I believe that the town peers, uh, town's peer review of beta group will report particularly, specifically Bill McGrath, that all site civil issues have been addressed to beta satisfaction and Bowler Engineering will speak to that. Uh, Randy Marin from Bowler Engineering will also report that the fire department access issue has been adequately addressed. Uh, Greg Lucas, the traffic um, engineer and peer reviewer at Beta, um, has reported that um, mat matters raised by him in his review, uh, several reviews of the traffic uh, impact study have likewise been satisfactor satisfactorily resolved. Uh, as you are aware from correspondence with the Rider Street representatives, and we had a meeting um, with Alexander T. Nicole Weber and Peter Morandos, uh, beginning of April, um, we've sent a letter dated May 4th, 2021, addressed to you, Mr. Chairman, as to the issues that have been resolved, we believe, the transportation demand management plan. We do have a letter from Mr. T um, that it's an undated letter, but I believe the Zoning Board of Appeals has it with several issues um, that have been raised. The first one is the parking data and whether the parking data is sufficiently valid. Uh, and it references one data point, but I think Mr. Lucas will uh, tell the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals that there are several data points. Um, uh, you may recall from reading his revised report that Beta had us go back out and do traffic counts at Arlington 360, the, the Legacy and Brigham Alta, uh, and we provided that data. So we have several data points um, to sustain the parking uh, calculations. Um, the, my client has agreed to make as a condition of the tenants leases that they cannot park on uh, the public streets or on Ryder Street, which is a private way. And to do so will be a lease violation. I think that's a significant uh, concession. Uh, you also have a letter, Mr. Chairman, that I sent to uh, Susan Chapnick uh, detailing the reason that my client is seeking a waiver for parking spaces located within the 25 foot buffer. Uh, that letter is dated May 4th. I can review that, but you do have that information. Um, item number two of uh, Mr. T's letter does not involve this project, so I'm not gonna address it. Um, item number three, the South Rider Lane configuration. Um, we have had a number of discussions about the configuration of, of the, the travel lane in South uh, Rider Street. Um, it is impossible to make it um, a uh, two, stripe it as a two way because it is not wide enough. And it's, it's kind of a paradox because in a conundrum because it could be big enough, but for the parking um, on the nine Rider Street side or the encroachment um, of the yards on the other side of the street, we are not looking to uh, change any of that. Uh, we're not looking to uh, cause a hardship to the neighbors by uh, looking to the town to remove the parking or to take back the land. Um, the parking data shows, uh, excuse me, the traffic data shows that there is no net increase of additional um, vehicles exiting uh, during peak uh, time. So there's no impact. Uh, you did raise Mr. Chairman, the telephone pole uh, I believe you raised two issues, the telephone pole on South Rider Street and the telephone pole in the um, easement on Mass Ave. With respect to the telephone pole on South Rider Street, that's up towards the driveway of the nine Rider Street condominiums. If the utility company, when it relocates the utilities, does not move that pole, what my client proposes to do is to do a bump out so that there'll be handicapped access. Okay. Um, with respect to the Mass Ave entrance, uh, I have spoken with attorney Anessi and we have addressed his concerns. Um, he wanted additional signage in his parking lot that um, uh, people cannot park there, that it, um, it would be entrance only for Mass Ave, Rider Street will be exit only, and the, the work bar tenants will likewise be required to follow the same path, entrance only Mass Ave, exit only Rider Street and there will be a speed bump perpendicular to Mass Ave at the Quinn Road connector. 
uh, let's see, with respect to uh, Joel Bargman will highlight the uh, minor changes. As you know, from uh, what we submitted, we've gone from 130 unit scheme to 124 units. Uh, the changes are minor. He will describe the reason for the changes. One of them is uh, the utility uh, pole that needs to go in there and revisions based on comments from the ZBA and minor ch and changes to the amenity space. Uh, we have also reconfigured the spaces in the parking garage and will now require eight total compact spaces. Uh, as the zoning board knows, you have the ability to grant up to 20% of the spaces in a parking lot for compact cars. We're just looking for eight. So those are, um, I've reviewed and uh, what the number of issues and um, I would ask if we could to have, if you have no objection, I would have Randy Myron from Bowler review the site civil uh, matters that have been ad addressed and of concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if Mr. Myron would like to go ahead and start. Yep. Um, and uh, is, it, is it possible to share? Share my screen. Let me see. Andy, you're all set. I, can I am awesome. Okay, thank you. Should be able to um, go. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. I hope. Awesome. Good. Uh, so, as Mary kind of uh, mentioned, I I just wanted to touch on some of the site-related changes that were made uh, to address some of the concerns from both Beta as well as some concerns from the town. Um, and the first one I wanted to uh, share with you folks is the uh, the fire department uh, truck turning exhibit, which we actually just received an email from Deputy Chief Melly uh, this afternoon indicating that he is okay with this. And, um, you know, and I'll just I'll just quickly go over it with you folks. You know, it shows the uh, uh, Arlington's largest apparatus coming off a of Mass Ave uh, through the site. Um, and then over the, the new wider bridge now that can accommodate a fire truck um, and then making a left down our driveway. And one of Deputy Chief's concerns was his ability to really make this left maneuver coming out of our driveway onto Ryder, um, knowing that vehicles do park along Ryder Street. So what we did, we, we, we showed some, uh, some vehicles parked within Ryder uh, to show that the apparatus can still get by. And we're also proposing, there's a couple of signs here, um, one in this area right here, um, and another one here uh, that would indicate uh, no parking here to corner. And again, it's just to show, uh, it's just to you know, create enough room for that apparatus to make that maneuver. Um, so there's no parked vehicles within either this area or in this area in here. And we can share that email that we got from Deputy Chief Melly too. On that plan, sorry, can you show yep. the, the coming in off of Mass Ave on the main plan? I'm just curious about the location of the utility pole in the right of way. Oh, yep, this one right here. Yeah. Yep, there's one here. And there's another one right, right in this area here. Yep, and I'll, I'll speak to that uh, a little bit more. Uh, in a little bit. Um, and then the other item, the other item I want to touch on, uh, can folks see that now? I see the same plan. Oh, let me. I just want to share our latest uh, site plan. And without getting into a lot of the details uh, as to what was done to address a lot of the concerns here. We've essentially made, uh, there's been a lot of changes related to adding some signage uh, and adding striping to address uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, some of the comments from beta. Um, you know, and f as an example, you know, we're now showing some of these, these shared bike symbols uh, up and down our, um, our driveway that connects to Ryder. Uh, I think these are spaced at every 150 feet. Uh, there's some other signage to direct uh, bicyclists towards the, the Minuteman commuter bikeway, which is up towards the, I guess, to the north, you'd say, to direct them to the right. Um, 
And there was some other minor comments too, just to address some um, some striping changes and signage changes. Uh, you know, fairly minor for the most part. And I think um, Beta can probably speak to it a little uh, a little bit more. But just again, changing some of these striping symbols here, um, as well as some of the other signs, um, some of the locations of the signs here. And then that kind of gets into uh, Chairman Klein, what you had mentioned with the existing utility poles here within the uh, the Mass Ave driveway. After a series of discussions with both Eversource and uh, Verizon, um, they uh, these these utility poles service a lot of other customers in the area, and it's going to be nearly impossible to 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 relocate them. So we're proposing to keep these poles where they exist today. Um, and we're also proposing to, do, to work with the utility company to help better, I guess, um, make these poles more visible. Um, and we're really not sure what that will be yet. Not sure if it'll be adding some type of reflector or illuminating the pole, but we're, we're going to speak to the utility companies to see what can be done to help better, um, better illuminate those poles to motorists and vehicles. Um, and the other utility pole that's actually not shown on here that Joel's going to get into um, when he speaks to the uh, the modified building two here. There's actually there's another utility pole, kind of in the corner of building two, right in this area, um, that also is going to be uh, nearly impossible to relocate because it services other utilities. And as a result of that, we're proposing to notch, basically put a notch in this building two. Um, to maintain that that current location of that utility pole, um, and that that's generally it. Just in terms of just the um, some of the highlights of the of the site related changes. I know Joel's going to touch on some of the other stuff uh, with the uh, 124 unit plan and some of the modifications that have been made. Um, just want to ask the board at this. At this point, if there's any particular comments in regards to um, the site plan, if there's any questions or comments they would want to address at this time. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Uh, this, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I don't actually have something that I want to ask and have answered right now, but uh, I wondered if, if somehow the flow of this could be organized so that at convenient times you switch over to beta and get their comments because um, I'm uh, I'm getting uh, as town meeting goes on I'm getting to be more and more senior by the day and my ability to remember what is said at the long after a long time when beta finally gets a chance to come up is is going to be limited so if beta could, you know, if I, I leave it up to the applicant, but if you can identify convenient times to switch over and let beta comment on what you've said so far, um, that at least would help this member keep track of what's going on. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Revelak? Yes, uh, I just wanted to review the traffic circulation. Uh, the driveway to Ryder Street is exit only. Mass Ave is entrance only, and I believe it's Quinn Road is two-way. Do I have that right? That's correct. Yep. Thank, thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Perfect. Um, are there, at, at this stage, are there any uh, comments from Beta in regards to uh, site circulation and site plan? They'd like um, to Bill McGrath from Beta, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay. We did take a look at the revised plans uh, we had provided a letter dated April 22nd um, previously, and I think all the changes that have been made are positive. You know, I think the, the changes in the evolution of the relocation of Ryder Brook uh, really enhances the site. It sounds like conservation um, agrees with that as well. So I, I think from a civil stormwater perspective, uh, at this point, we don't have any further comments. I think there's some coordination that still has to happen, you know, as the, once the final design gets done before going into construction um, with submission of a construction management plan, uh, I think 
final permitting with with conservation but i would say at this this point we're we're satisfied with the civil site design thank you okay um mr Marin, did you have more or were we going to transfer uh, joel bargman was going to speak to the new design oh perfect thank you thank you i need to share the screen Joel, you're all set. You're good to go. All right. Can you all see that? I'm going to um, describe the changes to the site. This is the um, existing site. The white boundary is the area of concern. And describe the differences between what you've seen, the 130 unit scheme, and then what's being altered for various reasons that I will explain the 124 unit scheme. Um, the first is rather benign, but in looking at the relocation of Ryder Brook and this back portion of the site, we have taken out the expansion of the building that accommodated the ramp to the second floor of the garage. And so now that portion of the building that used to project out into Ryder, what is now the Ryder Brook relocation uh, is gone. And we think that has a positive impact on the um, elevation of that facade. In looking at the building, um, you know that from my previous presentation, we've spent a lot of time on the Millbrook sidewalk, the landscaping there, the landscaping along Millbrook to the right side of the site by the historic building three with the goal of making this a very pedestrian oriented development and um, bicycle oriented as well with cars being sort of the tertiary method of arrival and in keeping with that sense of scale we began to look at the building a little bit uh, more critical about how that might get adjusted. And, and there were three things that we did in that. Um, the other aspect of looking at this from a big picture perspective was we evaluated the right corner of what is building four. And we were within 10 feet of the property line between this property and the Myrat parking lot. And the team felt that it would be better urban design long-term to provide a little bit better buffer zone between our property and what may happen in who knows when, if, if at all, but it, it provided a little bit greater opportunity for uh, neighboring development without impacting the development on this side of the property if we were to shorten building four and provide a greater setback. The, the reason that that also came up is that we were all a little dissatisfied with this courtyard that was the private courtyard for the property. It's a very narrow space. It's, it's anchored by a two stories of garage and four stories of building. And we felt that by cutting off that corner of the building, we would, uh, in addition to what I previously mentioned, we would significantly improve the outdoor space, and, and I'll show you how a perspective of how that happens. Um, the third, so here you can see the, the building is cut back 30 feet, and now our um, edge of the building is actually 40 feet from the property line. Uh, Mary mentioned that the amenity space was modified. Um, I will say that with the improvements to the site or, and, and the bridge, there's quite a bit more to this project than our typical multifamily housing project. So we were really looking to economize the building as best we could so as not to have to compromise any aspect of the property. Um, by reducing the second floor of the amenity space, we um, are able to save some square footage construction cost and um, really right size the amenities to a 124 unit project and then use that savings 
um, for the amenity space on some of these improvements that we're doing, such as the, uh, the relocation of the Ryder Brook. Uh, one of the other changes was to bring the green space closer to the edge of the, of the property here and uh, as shown here. So there's, there's quite a bit of landscaping. You can see there's some new landscaping on the sides here that's quite extensive. And, and we didn't want to shortchange that by just trying to do everything so that the decision was made to focus our energies on a few spaces that were super important and take out the second floor of the amenity space. And I will show you um, that. So it's the technical introduction. As was mentioned, uh, building two, the telephone pole is on this corner. That utility pole services more than just our property. So we've allowed 10 feet from the edge of the pole so that other properties can put transformers on that pole as need be, and we'll still have the proper dimensional clearance between the pole, the transformer, in the face of our building to meet the utility company regulations. So that's, that's a 10 foot plus setback um, cut out of this corner of the building. Um, that caused us to move the stair and the elevator. Um, the stair was in this corner of the plan. So there's a, a minor change there um, to pick up some of the square footage and to address one of Chairman Klein's comments about the length of the arcade and the sort of commercial feeling about it, we brought out the residential end of the building. Previously, the arcade went all the way through and, and uh, this sort of is a, makes it a little bit smaller scale and enhances this corner unit and makes uh, a more residential corner on the building. We're able to get a balcony in that unit out to the brook. So those are minor changes on the building two. And then here you can see the difference between the 30 foot area that we cut off the building. It's quite a significant change. And you can see relative to building three, we're pulling the building back almost to the third point from where it was. It used to align with the outside edge of the building. And, and now it's cut back to the third point, which we think makes that historic building free. And uh, I think you'll see in the perspective a little happier in the landscape. You also notice that this extension that connected the lobby to building three is gone. Um, by eliminating that, you, you actually go outside now to do what's uh, a small fitness area and a small amenity space in building three. But, um, you know, that's an, that's an issue maybe four months of the year. It really has a, a tremendous impact on the outdoor space. It has a really nice impact on the historic character of building three. And um, we think it's, um, it, it also solves some handicap accessibility issues because the floor of this portion of the building is not the same as this portion. So as you saw in our landscape plan, um, we have a sort of easier landscape transition um, from the lobby space to the building. And then there's another crisscross handicap uh, ramp that brings you to the outdoor space that we did not have in the previous. So it, it sort of connects the lobby to the whole Millbrook side of the building in an accessible manner, which is, we think, an improvement um, given the focus on the outdoor space of the property. So with that, this is coming into the site. And I mentioned that we really tried to focus on the pedestrian scale. One advantage we thought of lowering the amenity space was the scale of that building driving to the entry was uh, more in the scale of a person. So it was just a little bit less two stories, four stories, and hierarchically, um, we thought the entry showed up better and, and that building was a little bit tamer compared to building four, which now has more freedom against the facade as opposed here, it was sort of half and half against the new construction. So we, we thought the corner of building four 
uh, I mean, building one, excuse me, was enhanced by that move as well as the scale of this entry. The entry is also bigger. So it, it's almost the same width as the drive aisle. Whereas in the previous, uh, it, it was you know about two thirds to a half. Whoops. Here you can see the arcade went all the way through and it was clad metal. Um, now we only have the, metal, the arcade going through for a portion. It's clad in the same siding material as the upper portion of the building, but instead of clabbered, it's a smooth panel. So it still has a little bit different scale and it's brighter. So it really calls out the entry as you're coming down into the site. That entry is the first point you see here you have the the work bar walking to the entry on this side so this is a very important crosswalk and um, we appreciate the suggestion to take a look at this uh, arcade area here you see the previous courtyard design and here's the new courtyard design with the lower uh, amenity space um, we've changed our program in here there's now a package storage where this uh, wall is, that blank wall sort of helps to define on one side the bike room. There's our, our bike room and bike repair area here, and then the entry to the building between building four and building one on the middle of the image. The rendering of the facade has been changed a little bit. Um, we, we've uh, put, actually put a cornice in between the lower portion and the sort of mansard roof portion of the building. Here's a, what I was focusing on in the courtyard when we previously had the connector link and the two-story base to the building. And here's now the one-story base and the, the link eliminated. And you can see now that building three is free of any new it's a historic building standing in the landscape, which is really part of the idea of the design is this ensemble of buildings that were built at different times. So you have building three, building one, building four, and, and we've articulated the different facades to carry through that idea of industrial architecture being um, assembled over time and in different manners and different materials. So I think we're all quite excited here with this new space. And here you see on the far side, that's that handicap ramp that connects now the back side of the lobby down to Millbrook, which is an improvement that we did not have. You can see in these elevations, uh, here's the previous elevation of the building. I, I know elevations are tough to look at, but you can see how much shorter 30 feet makes on the building. What's really interesting is we've, we've been able to take 15,000 square feet of space out of the project. Um, in a normal project, that would be the loss of 15 units, which we really don't want to do. Um, we want to keep the heart and soul of the project with his apartments and affordable units. So we're only down six units, um, and the rest we've managed to take out of uh, parking garage space, um, the amenity space, and really just tightening up the project as much as we can. Um, taking the ramp out, I, I thought, um, really improved the backside of the building. It, it's quite a bit shorter. Um, by having it be shorter, we have these sort of four bay, five bay windows that happen across the back and help articulate the volumes. But the whole idea of the facade is that it's now broken up into smaller pieces the end of the building that's by the garden, the outdoor space is, is green cement board. The entry courtyard is the gray. So the, the building and the coloration changes with the outdoor spaces. And, and we think that's really a, an exciting concept. And that breakup of the facade happens on the sides and, and we think help m mitigate the large, uh, larger new building with the large existing buildings. And building two hasn't changed other than for the fact that this arcade uh, is only a portion of the building as I showed in the perspectives. So uh, the changes in summary are we have in, we were increasing the pervious area on site by 275%. That's now up to 284. The number of units is from 130 to 
124 with still 25% affordable. Um, the parking spaces are 135, and I'm sorry, this is incorrect. It's 128, not 127, which allows us to maintain a similar ratio between bedrooms and parking spaces in the old versus the new scheme. And then as we've talked about previously, we have the 44 bike spaces as a waiver request. Um, those are designed per Arlington standards. We obviously have other storage systems in the garage to um, handle additional cars. And with that, I'll pass it on back to Mary and um, questions or on to Brian for the traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there questions from the board about the we're just seeing? Questions and com or comments from Beta Group? Just again, Bill McGrath from Beta, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, just one question on the, the 124 unit um, concept. I noticed that there's some additional surface parking in the back by building four. Correct. I'm just uh, wondering how that, that's gonna be drained and where's the runoff from that go? Randy? Yeah, uh, I believe we're gonna be collecting that as part of the, uh, as part of the garage bill. And we can, we can certainly share those plans um, for your review. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then the, I just had one quick question was you had referred um, to get from, I believe it's from building four to building three, um, that there was a series of exterior ramps to go from one to the other. I just wanted to, um, to ask, are they ramps or are they just a or are they just slope sidewalk? I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're slope sidewalk. So it's a less than one in 20 okay. grade. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. I th I'm enthralled by the pictures and I was wondering if the applicant could make the slides that it, it, it's showing us tonight available so that we can go back and review them and appreciate them at our leisure. Absolutely, we can email them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, is there anything further from members of the board? We'll proceed with the updates to the traffic design. So, I mean, with regards to the updates, we, we didn't really have many updates as much as just addressed what um, Beta's concerns were in the comment letter. Um, circulation, you know, as Randy had, had mentioned, is being maintained as, as we previously submitted. Um, so, you know, aside, maybe it, if Greg wants to, you know, address anything that he saw, but for the most part, what everybody read uh, in the previous report and what we've been discussing has hold has held true. Thank you, Greg. Did you have any? Yeah, I can. I can. I can add to that. Um, you know, as as Brian indicated, we had in our previous review, we had asked for a lot of um, additional verification of some of the numbers regarding. Um, regarding demand for parking, the comparable sites, as Mary alluded to in her introductory comments. Um, we, you know, some of the data was, it, it was, it was inconsistent between the sites and it wasn't, um, it, it, that we they weren't collecting the same times. And so we just wanted additional data and they went out and got new data that confirmed the conclusions that they had already made. The data was essentially the same in all instances. And so, now Beta satisfied that um, those conclusions as to the necessary amount of parking and confirming that that um, that parking demand is met, where where um, we would agree that that's satisfied. Thank you. Were there any other outstanding questions in the traffic review? Um, there had been there had been some site comments which which were responded to um, by niche and so and the site revisions have also helped address those. Um, we had noted in our response and in our um, 
email distribution to those responses that the compact spaces, as has been discussed, are allowed um, by bylaw. Um, and they are they're well below the 20% threshold for compact spaces in the current configuration of garage parking. Okay. No other issue, no other outstanding issues from our review perspective. Okay. Any questions or comments on the board? Seeing none. Um, Ms. O'Connor. Oh. Chairman Klein, we hadn't have nothing else to add at this point. Okay. We're just excited about the project and we think it with all of the input it is going to be a beautiful development of that area. Well, certainly the, on behalf of the board, we really appreciate all the work that that your team has been doing and the work that Beta has been doing to uh, to review this. Uh, through multiple iterations um, to get us to this point. It's really very much appreciated. Um, are there questions, other questions from the board? <clears throat> Mr. Mills. I just have one really minor one, uh, Chairman. Uh, they uh, speak about enforcing the parking regulations by a lease violation. Uh, how are they going to put teeth in that? Who will actually do the uh, enforcement of that? Who are they going to complain to? There'll be a, a on-site property manager, Mr. Mills. Um, and if a resident sees someone parking there, if they call the on-site property manager, um, that they'll take the property manager will take care of it. But it will that actually is, constitute a lease violation subject to them to eviction. Thank you for your answer. I, I do want to commend you for some substantial improvements in your design. And working with the locals. That's very much appreciated. Other questions from the board? I did have one other question in regards to the, the bicycle access from Ryder Street, um, where there's the sharrows are shown in both directions overlaid onto a, a one way traffic lane. Um, is that something that has been done elsewhere and is that a something that works successfully or is that something that leads to uh, to altercations like, I'm not sure sorry I, um it, it is uh it has been used before and it's primarily done for this application to respond to concerns um there you know there has been comments along about um you know, bicycle access, is this gonna be two way for bicycles? Is it gonna be only one way? So we have included those pavement markings in response to uh, the neighborhood concerns and comments. And we, uh, in, in, you know, um, decided to show the, sh or add shadows to the Rider Street connector as well as uh, bike signage. Is there enough width to have a one way bike lane heading into the site? and then have just outgoing sharrows with the car direction of traffic? Or is there not enough width in there to do something like that? I believe there's not enough width. Okay. Yeah, that would be our impression as well. There isn't enough width, um, especially because there's parking allowed along that connector. Okay. And then the only other thought I had was um, at the very end of that connector where it enters Rider Street, I know that there'll be signage that that last effective space um, it's not, you know, there's no parking here to corner. Um, if there could be some form of striping on the pavement as well to reinforce that. Or we can add some striping. Unfortunately, if it is the size of a parking space, somebody will try to utilize it as such. Yep. Other questions from the board? Seeing none. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to public comment. Um, so in a moment, I'll open the public comment period on the revised design for the proposed project, 1165R Ministry Avenue. Uh, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matters at hand to be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision uh, to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow inclusion of many voices, the chair as public speakers to um, 
to limit their comments and I encourage you to use your time to provide comments related to the indicated topics. Additional time uh, will be provided at the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be answered. Uh, chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record, especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to the project. Procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You will be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps us generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the, the public comment period for this evening will be closed. Uh, board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you would like a specific document pulled up during your comments, please do ask us to do so. And so I have a pair of hands up already. I will start with Mr. Moore. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, one, one quick question. Uh, actually, first, through you, could uh, they describe, please, the access to the bikeway? Describe the intersection of this project and the bikeway and access to the site from the bikeway. Sure. Um, uh, just to be clear, you're talking about access from the Minuteman bikeway, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, access along Ryder Street um, uh, north of our driveway is going to remain the same. What we will provide is the signage and the striping um, at the at the intersection where the Ryder Street Driveway meets the Ryder Street. Um, we don't have the right. Up. I'm sorry. I'll share it. Th thank you. Okay. So uh, the owner does not have rights to do anything to the north of our driveway. So we're uh, doing everything in our within our means to um, provide that bicycle access. But aside from what we can do, it's the access to the Minuteman bikeway is going to remain as is. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, another question. Um, uh, along the Minuteman bikeway, these, these access points, the major access points uh, have traffic in and out, some more than others. Um, and honestly, personally, I don't have experience with the Ryder Street access currently in terms of how much on and off uh, bikeway traffic there is at that point. Um, I just want to make sure that the um, the proponents of the, the development are uh, taking into account bike traffic, uh, considerable potentially bike traffic along the edge of their site and any safety concerns or or um, uh, signage is, is great, that, that's good, that's real helpful. But I'm just thinking if there is a significant amount of traffic, are there safety concerns being taken into account for bike, bike access to the uh, traffic along your site? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, Mr. Zmolpa, I don't know if there's any further comments on that along those lines. Uh, I don't really have any further comments. We, you know, we kind of went through that uh, width is limited uh, in that area, so we are providing accommodations as uh, we feel necessary to accommodate the neighborhood. And Thank you. Uh, Mr. T. Hello, uh, this is Alex T, to Ryder Street. Um, so I have a two part question. Uh, one is really appreciate that there's more data uh, into the parking than I realized. Um, first part of my question is, I, would, I guess I want to understand uh, from our traffic professionals if there's absolutely no risk, some risk, or lots of risk uh, to this overflow scenario, uh, as even you know one or two cars on our street uh, can make a big difference in terms of daily parking. Um, and then I, the second part of my question is, you know, I, again, data is as good as the data we have, but there are still assumptions, and so I, I kind of want to better understand. Uh, what happens if those assumptions don't hold true? I certainly appreciate the spirit of the lease, um, but again, that's a, that's a kind of a, a big burden to police that um, for us. It's, an, it's a constant stress and strain, uh, and, and it's just kind of a constant source of conflict. 
which feels like a disproportionate burden on those that will have to police and enforce that. And I'm kind of curious if there are also other measures. Again, I think eviction is, is certainly uh, one, one potential answer, um, but is there something on the lower threshold where there's some kind of towing policy uh, for respondent in a certain amount of time, or if it becomes a more perpetual bigger issue, is it on the table to reduce the number of occupied apartments? Again, I just, you know, a one size fits all solution doesn't always necessarily work. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. T. Um, if I could put those on to, um, to Mr. Zamolka and Mr. Uh, Mr. Lucas in regards to both the questions about what's the, what's the sort of the, the risk of parking overflows and then um, I can go back to, to Mary in regards to uh, what would happen if those don't hold. So, um, you know, as we have shown, we've done um, numerous parking studies, uh, three different data points. Um, and, you know, our research based on uh, local apartment complexes is that there's going to be adequate parking. Um, you know, with what the development can do, you know, we've reiterated that we have a transportation coordinator and it'll be built into the lease. Um, you know, aside from that, you know, there's, there's nothing physical we can do. Um, Mary, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I, I, and with respect, we could not tow off of that uh, right of way. I can tell you that as a matter of law, mm -hmm. um, we could not do that. Um, that's that side of the right of way is actually owned by the town of Arlington. Um, and we would not be in a position that we could tow legally. Uh, it's a, I understand nothing is ever 100% foolproof, but we have done the studies and we have looked at the data and based on the other three developments, we feel very comfortable and secure that there's adequate parking there. I mean, uh, frankly, uh, eviction is a, a serious um, penalty for violating the parking uh, requirement and the property manager will review that in the lease with the prospective tenants at the time the lease is signed. Mm -hmm. um, if, if a tenant sees, you know, it's just like anybody, you know, our own houses, when you see somebody park repeatedly in front of your house, you might call the Arlington police and say, you know, there's a strange and different person um, parking in front of my house repeatedly. Um, I guess, you know, if you're concerned and you see someone repeatedly parking there, a call to the property manager will resolve that. Well, thank you. The other, point, the other point I would add and invite either, either Ms. O'Connor or Ms. Mr. Zamolka to comment on is that these parking spaces will be leased. And so there's control over the number of tenant vehicles that will be allowed access to the garage and to the parking provided on site. Thank you. Um, Ms. O'Connor, this is sort of a, almost a side question, but for residents of Ryder Street who do have street access rights, what is the, what is the current procedure that for them to have cars removed that are from their property that are not theirs? From the right of way? From the right of way. I, I would have to check the statute. I know that we wouldn't have that ability because mm -hmm. um, uh, on that side of the town right of way, but I could check that. I, I don't think the residents could have them towed. Yeah, I'm trying. I, I used to help manage a property in the back bay, and I'm trying to remember what the procedure was for towing a vehicle from a private way. It's been a while. Yeah. I can check that. Appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, has anyone had, I, I take it from what's just been said that the town is a major owner of at least half of the, of Ryder Street. Um, and that presumably is part of the area that people are parking on. Have any conversations happened with the town about controlling what's going on under property, which I assume that the town has control over? We've had no conversations with the town. I think, um, Alex, were you going to have some conversations with the town manager? Yeah, I did reach out to uh, Adam uh, about three or four weeks ago. I had not heard back. So that was going to be a follow up of mine just to see if the ZBA could make a warm introduction for us so that we could uh, 
be as collaborative as possible. I mean, it, it does seem odd that that this should be just a Wild West venue that nobody seems to have control over over you know what what goes on there and and maybe that's just what happens when everything is all fractionated like this but you know generally the board of uh, the select board has control over parking policy at least on public streets and owns part of this one and you would think that there's something that could be done now other than just calling calling the police department and i'm not quite sure what it is Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. DuPont. So I would like to follow up on this as well. And, and maybe if I might direct my question to Ms. O'Connor, I'm just wondering if you're saying essentially that there is no parking off site as part of the lease. And should you do that, then you're in violation of the lease. Is that the under is that correct, that understanding? Yes, Mr. DuPont. So the other part I wonder is, I do understand, I think that you're saying that as of right, you wouldn't be able to go and tow somebody who is on rider, nor would the, uh, the residents be able to tow as of right. But I'm wondering if you might not be able to put in language into a lease, and maybe this is a stretch, but put language into a lease where the uh, tenant is essentially consenting to uh, your authority to tow in the event that they violate that prescription. So just a, just a thought, I mean, it might be by agreement as opposed to by right. I will look at that. The, the issue I think is because it is owned by the town, um, the, the town would have to consent to such a process. All right, okay. thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hamlin, could I just one other question? I, I do understand that eviction is a pretty big uh, is a pretty big penalty for these violations, <clears throat> and it seems to me that that's actually a flaw rather than a feature here because when it, it it was like in the old days when in when for every minor crime the only penalty was to hang someone uh there weren't that many hangings that I mean, there were a lot of hangings that took place um but the not a lot of, of effective law enforcement and it is often better to have a more certainly applied lesser penalty uh than to have an extreme one that you'll be very reluctant to to do and I'm wondering if there's any way of dealing in the lease, maybe this is just a more general statement of what Mr. DuPont was, was talking about, but some kinds of things like like forfeitures or, or fines or, or, you know, some elements that fall short of sort of the equivalent of capital punishment so that there could be more confidence that the, that the sanctions will actually be imposed. A fine, I think a fine is a good idea, Mr. Hamlin. A hefty fine. Thank you both. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I could jump in here. Yes, Mr. Haverty. I, I just think that whatever you want to put in for a provision regarding this needs to be run by the subsidizing agency because it obviously would be applicable to the affordable units as well as to the market rate units. And we want to make sure we're not running a foul of any requirements of the subsidizing agency. So if the provisions were a part of a sort of a, you know, the, the regulations for the applicant, that's not something that would impact our decision. That would be something that they would have to take up with the agency afterwards. Well, again, if, if they're going to impose this as a requirement, it's something the subsidizing agency may want to be able to review and may have some feeling. Certainly, if you're talking about an eviction mm -hmm. provision for not paying um, parking fines, I think that the subsidizing agency is going to have a significant problem with that. Okay. Um, so, again, I, I, you know, in terms of the board's decision, you don't necessarily need to include it as a, as a specific condition. You can have a provision that requires it to be addressed in the management contract board would you know, have the opportunity to review that management contract prior, prior to the issuance of certificates of occupancy. Mm -hmm. 
but you just want to make sure that at some point it gets reviewed by the subsidizing agency so you don't run a foul of their requirements. Very well taken. Thank you. Um, the next their hand up was Ms. Contreras. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, so first to um, somewhat piggyback on Mr. Hanlon's comment, um, as an abutter who would be placed in a position to report someone knowing that their end result might be eviction would be an awful moral position to place abutters in. I can't imagine doing that to someone for a parking violation. So the idea that an, a, that burden on the abutters is then also this really kind of traumatizing moral one, it, it seems it's very off-putting um, now that I'm thinking through this um, as the reality of reporting uh, mechanism that's been proposed. Um, I'm also, I'm curious, so it's not the, well, there is an issue of the tenants actually not parking, but with such a low um, parking ratio, parking to unit ratio, it's actually more, and then we see this now um, with the larger nine rider, and certainly uh, my household has been guilty of this, um, just when you have guests over, where do they park? Um, currently, I'm not sure if the four spots along the mill are counted toward the space to unit ratio or if they're excluded because they're supposed to be for non-tenants. Um, but the idea is that when guests come over and we're talking at a scale of 120 plus units, where do those guests park? Um, and those people, those are not people whose leases can be, you know, marked against or that, you know, so it's just, it's hard to understand the procedures around if parking overflows, even by a couple of cars on rider, it disrupts a system greatly. And we experience that. And mm -hmm. on our street, we have certain solutions um, but you know, it's, it's fewer and far between, but we don't have the presence of 120 plus units right now. So that's just, that's more thinking. I don't mean to ask for an answer, but that's something that's really at the top of um, my concerns. Um, I also want to echo Mr. Moore's, um, concerns about the, the experience of going to the Minuteman bike bikeway uh, for the tenants. Again, I think when we think about the scale of what is being added to Rider Street, if every unit becomes a cyclist, obviously that's a really positive thing. Um, even if a third of them are cyclists, that's a really positive thing. That's less cars being used. But currently, I, I really don't see how the cyclists commute to the bike path has really been taken into consideration. I don't understand how pedestrians have really been thought through. This still seems like a very car centric plan. And as much as I want there to be guest parking, those four guest parking spots along Mill, I think that they're actually, they're, we're making a lot of choices to preserve those four parking spaces when really they could be used to enhance the safety and travel and wayfinding of pedestrians, cyclists, and motor vehicles. So I, I it's a, this feels like a double-edged sword, but those four parking spaces, I mean, I know that the Conservation Commission had concerns about them. Obviously they've, um, they felt that it wasn't to the point of not approving them, but just why are those four parking spaces so important and or why are they more important than making that way much more safe for the huge influx of cyclists and pedestrians? Thank you. 
Could I answer that, Ms. Fitz? Thank you. Yes, Ms. O'Connor. Um, first of all, those four parking spaces are part of the parking ratio that we need for um, residents. And um, I believe the traffic engineer has testified, has um, provided information as to the safety of the sharrows in and out for the, for the bicyclists. Um, our, my client is not going to do anything to the north of Ryder Street. That property will get developed at some point and that will be for this board or for the planning board to make them uh, do the improvements. We're doing them from the Ryder connector all the way to um, Ryder Street and making it a handicapped accessible walk, uh, walkway. Um, Ms. O'Connor, what are the provisions for guest parking? There's no, there's no on-site guest parking. They'd have to park on Mass Ave. I don't know if it's if it's fair. Is guest parking would guest parking be allowed at the rink? I I have no idea. We didn't look at that issue. Yeah. And the tenants would be notified that all guest parking has to be accommodated on. Yes, that we'll, Avenue. We'll put in the lease that accommodated on Mass Ave. So all the spaces on site are either for residents or for uh, tenants at work bar. That's correct. Okay. Can I ask a follow up? Yes, indeed. I was just going to ask. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is in my public comment for the meeting as well, but there's also been, so I think instead of just, I'm not trying to demand something, I'm asking the applicants to think about the, the very large number of cyclists and pedestrians that are, because of this project, are being added to this small ecosystem that's a very un, currently an unsafe ecosystem. I'm also concerned about, I mean, I like the fact that the corridor will be revamped and, and improved and will be wonderful to look. We enjoy the raccoon family that lives in the in the moat and the and the ducks are there right now. But what about like that also means that pedestrians and cyclists will be in and that's the point of this is to be encouraged to come visit the millstream corridor that's been revamped for public use. And so just a group of people that we have not talked yet about, or I, I haven't heard about yet, are the people that the, uh, th that this project will bring to the site who do not live there, um, who typically might go through Ryder Street or go past Ryder Street, but are now entering Ryder Street um, from the bike path and coming and seeing the mill stream. I'm very curious about what is that actual commute and experience look like? Where do their bikes go? I know there's bike racks, but in reality, what do you anticipate you know, the numbers being and where are people going? Are people going to be following like the rules or bike path? You know, there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of experiential care that I, I haven't yet really understood from the applicant. And these, I just, I'm very, I see so many close calls. I'm very concerned about the pedestrians and cyclists that we have not talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. O'Connor, has there been any? Well, the pedestrians um, to, would come down the South Ryder Street, new uh, handicapped accessible sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and I've already spoken to the, the bike path issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ms. Lando, I don't know if the planning department has done any research into what improvements to the to the Millbrook corridor might do in terms of uh, bringing additional visitors to the area. Do you know? Do you know if there's any, been any research along those lines? Uh, we did the Millbrook corridor report, but I think another thing to note is that we are just putting out, if it's not already out, an RFP for a um, Minuteman bikeway planning study. Um, which will study the entire length of the bikeway specifically. 
and look at improvements to connections to the bikeway along several key points. And I know this was listed as a potential area for more in-depth study by the by whatever consultant um, is selected for that project. So um, that RFP, it doesn't look like it's up now, but it should be going up this week. And um, we would begin that planning process very, very soon. And that will have a significant public engagement portion to it as well. Is there a particular um, committee that's overseeing that? So that is funded through the Community Preservation Act. Um, and then that will be, I believe, overseen with um, ABAC, uh, the Arlington Bicycle Advisory Committee. Uh, with input from various other transportation oriented committees in town. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ms. Contreras, was there any further questions? Uh, not, not right now, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Weber? Hi, good evening, um, 14 Ryder Street. Um, so I have a couple different um, things to ask about. The first one is safety. I think that's uh, one of our main concerns and I would like to add to the people that are using this is um, as a mother of a middle schooler, the middle school population, this is a migration corridor for middle schoolers from the bike path and it needs to be um, central to the town's um, worry basically <laughs> and Mr. Mr. Hanlon mentioned that we need to put this more in front of um, as a town of how we're going to address this and I think um, our middle schoolers uh, need it because there's a lot of middle schoolers <laughs> traveling through the street every day and I've I like many of my neighbors have seen some very close calls um, mine is homeschooling so I don't have to worry about mine right now but they'll be out there next year <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess my dog's upset about it too. Um, so, and another thing is like, if I'm biking, I'm also a biker. If I'm entering that street, it would feel like it would be very unsafe to be going into oncoming traffic. Um, are you gonna let me talk? <laughs> and so I just wanna put that out there that that, entering an oncoming traffic with a bike would be feeling very unsafe for me. Um, the second round of things I want to talk about is conservation. And I'm a conservation biologist. So I want to know if Sable, come here, baby. If the, if the older trees are going to be considered um, to be left alone with this new plan, um, the new design in hand, um, and also if the parking service surfaces and surfaces in general can be um, pervious rather than impervious so that there's not a huge runoff into the brook from all of the um, surfaces at hand. Uh, the 30 foot decrease in uh, building height, is that gonna impact the shade um, of Ryder Street or is it gonna be more effective to Mass Ave? And um, the third section is, you mentioned a parking waiver. I wanted to know more about that. Um, what does that mean? And I also am worried about parking along the street with people um, coming to visit and just in general, and also um, coming to visit the neighbors in the, in the building. And we wanna be welcoming, but we just wanna be, you know, we don't want to be policing our neighbors. So we want to put more of that back on the people that are renting to them or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, my, so my first question, um, so back to you. So the, the middle schoolers who are coming through this area, did they eventually cross Mass Ave at Appleton? Is that where they're crossing, Do you know? They're kind of, flowing through this area so they could go up one way and over the other way but they generally go across mass ave um in that area so okay uh, mr chair steve revelock um yeah. i bike through well outside of pandemic times i would you know bike along mass ave towards lexington in the morning and I, there would usually be a crossing guard uh with middle school students uh typic there's a crosswalk uh where appleton and mass ave intersect and that's usually where i've seen them cross okay 
So they're not trying to sort of jump across Mass Ave more in line with Forest Street. Not that I have observed, but you know, no, I, I generally see the the crossing where the uh, see the kids crossing where uh, the crossing guard is located, and that would be at Appleton Street. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, traffic. Um, I, I don't know if there's a question specifically for Mr. Marin or not. Um, so what is, so I know there's not very many trees on the lot to begin with, but um, I know there's a row of trees just across uh, Mill Brook, which are not involved in the project because they fall outside the project uh, boundary. Um, but are there other, and, and I, must, I believe the only other trees that are existent on the site are in the Ryder Brook corridor, is that correct? Are we talking about, I guess, existing trees? Existing trees. I think those are the only areas where there's I, right now. I, I believe so also, yes. Okay. And then the, old, you, the older trees that Ms. Weber is referring to are not on my client's property. Those are the ones across the mill brook, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. And then could, Randy, can you answer that parking surface comment? Yep, I guess uh, Chairman Klein, are you were, please were you continue? No, I was just going to ask you to do the exact same thing. Sure. Uh, for the uh, the surface drainage question or uh, item that was raised. Yeah, so under under existing conditions, the entire site um, is just kind of sheet flows to uh, Millbrook, and we are proposing a new stormwater management system here to really collect the runoff, uh, treat it. Uh, because of the increase in landscaped areas or pervious areas, there's a significant decrease in runoff rates uh, for all storm events, um, and it really should be a big benefit over what's out there today. Um, and it should be an improvement. Um, um, to the surrounding area. And I know Beta has reviewed our, our stormwater uh, design and I, I don't wanna speak for them, but I believe um, they are generally comfortable with everything, so. And my understanding is that the, the system doesn't have any particular stormwater retainage on site. It's more treatment and discharge, is correct? That's correct. And then I think there was an, uh... Mr. Klein, a question about the decrease in building height. Yep. Question about the shadow impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Joel, can you take that? Mr. Bargman question or? Nope, oh, you're on mute though, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So there was a question raised about the changes to the, the height of the building and what the impact would be on the shadows, whether they would. The overall height of the building is unchanged. The only change to the height is at the amenity space that was uh, 28 feet to the top of the roof and is now 14 feet to the top of the roof. Okay. And Chairman Klein, the only thing I would like to just emphasize is um, as the traffic impact study has established that there is no increase during peak traffic times in traffic coming out of the Ryder Street connector for my client's property. And I understand the concerns of the neighbors, their frustration I would suggest is to the businesses to the north of Ryder Street um, and the trucks and the speed of the trucks, but we cannot control that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the town could, could control that. Um, uh, Ms. Weber, were those all your questions? Um, I'd like to actually follow up on a couple of those. Um, sure. With the new landscape added to the land um, around there, is there going to be a lot of pesticides used that could be also in the runoff from the building uh, in treating the land? I want to think about that. Also, uh, why couldn't there be a gray water system from some of the runoff if you're treating it? Why couldn't you reuse it uh, in the building from that point of view? And um, I disagree with the middle school migration corridor because 
um, as it's an exit point for the building, a lot of people will be leaving in the morning to go to work around the times that the middle schoolers use that space. Thank you. Um, is O'Connor, is there, I, I, I don't recall, I don't know if Ms. Linema maybe know as well, uh, whether there were particular um, conditions that were being discussed with the Conservation Commission in regards to pesticide use within the, the riverfront zone? We didn't get to that yet. I'm sure that'll be in the order of conditions. Okay. Karen Klein, could I, could I um, just answer oh. that question? Ms. Chapnick, I didn't realize you were with us. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm just not on video. Um, it, it is a standard condition of the Conservation Commission that pesticide use is prohibited within our um, areas near resource areas and pretty pretty much the, the entire site is within a resource area of Mill Brook. Um, the, the, uh, the Ryder Brook feature that is being moved is being treated as, as you know, considering uh, that, that it will be protected. And we have discussed some permit um, conditions around that too. So um, pesticide use will not, not be permitted. Thank you. Um, then was, uh, was there any consideration of, of a gray water system for the building, whether for, um, uh, sort of irrigation or for other uses on site? Ms. O'Connor, I'm not sure who can address that question. I have to leave that to um, Randy Miram. Yeah, Mary, we might need Kyle for that one. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure what the, uh, what the plan is for uh, watering of the landscaping, if there's an irrigation system or if there was other um, methods. I, I don't, I don't want to speak for Kyle. I think there is an irrigation system. I remember there being some initial questions about irrigation in regards to the relocation of Ryder Brook, but I don't recall a wider discussion about the remainder of the property. Uh, Ms. Krause? I, I did um, I just want to bring up that we did discuss uh, the fact that they would not be irrigating the Ryder Brook uh, restoration area so that those those plants would need to establish with the, the natural and native um, uh, groundwater elevations. So at least in that area, it wouldn't be irrigated. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Zick's not with us this evening, is that correct? No, he's not. Okay. Okay, if, we could, if you wouldn't mind following up with him on that. I will, I'll follow up with him. That'd be great, thank you. Um, I think those were your questions, Ms. Weber. Last one was the timing of the middle schoolers using the area and the people leaving for work. Okay. Um, yeah, I believe Ms. O'Connor, you had said previously that the, the studies of when the, when the traffic will be occurring um, you had said there was no appreciable increase there during- was no increase during peak hour over existing conditions. Correct, Brian? From Ryder Street? That, that is correct. On Ryder Street Driveway, there is a zero net increase in traffic. Do you, do you know what the current, the current flow, the current traffic volume is? Um, I do not know it off the top of my head. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I wonder if Mr. Mulka can just clarify, when we're talking about peak hour, are we talking about a particular hour within the peak morning commute or more generally? And I'm just sort of interested in whether or not the peak hour for purposes of, of the traffic generation study is the same as the peak hour for um, kids going to school at Ryder, whether there there's some any disjunction there. So, um, Mr. Hanlon, um, those are good questions. So, when we study traffic, we study two P 
peak periods. It's the seven to nine in the morning and four to six in the evening. Um, and of those times, we determine the peak out one hour. And that is, um, that is the focus of each study and the impacts. So when we talk about the seven to nine period, that's the commuting um, from the apartments out. And the four to six period is the commuting times in. So the middle school, when the middle school lets out, we don't expect any um, project related traffic to um, come in along those times. But in, in the morning, in the morning, it presumably would, they'd be going to school, what, eight o'clock or something similar to that. And that would be within your peak hour or closely adjacent to it, but. Um, correct. It, um, but you have to also understand that we're not ha gonna have a net increase. What is experienced today is what you is going to be experienced in the future or once the project is con constructed. Well, what's, what's generating the traffic that's flowing out of there in the morning today? Um, currently, there's nothing flowing out of there. Flowing in would be the uh, existing office building. That I guess, be... I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to, my understanding is what the concern is, is that there are a lot of kids on Ryder Street. And what we care about in terms of the morning peak hour is whether or not there's an increase in traffic on Ryder Street. So if there's a lot of increase on Quinn Road or something, that's really not important for this, for this discussion. What's important is whether there's an increased number of cars that are leaving the site on Ryder Street and conflicting with the kids who are with the kids who are on the street. Um, and and that's what I we sort of need you to address because if it, it could easily turn out that there is a danger to the kids that is missed when you're doing the kind of comparison about traffic generation that we've been talking about. So the in the morning, there's actually going to be a decrease in traffic. Uh, at that Ryder Street driveway, we're uh, anticipating, well, we've calculated uh, a reduction in eight vehicles. So you're actually gonna have a reduction in number of vehicles during that morning period. And then- So, so I, I wonder what the, I mean, the chairman had, what started this last interchange was the chairman asking what it was that was causing the exit of traffic from the site onto Ryder Street. and. My understanding from your answer was that that would be the same, that there, that there isn't anything now that's exiting on Ryder Street. And I'm a little unclear. I mean, if you're just looking at what is the exit say, going on on Ryder Street, is, are there going to be more cars on there or eight fewer cars or something else? But I only care about Ryder Street right now. I don't care about any other way in or out of the site. I'm, uh, now, right I, now, you've got them going in and out on Ryder Street. If I, can, correct. Correct. If, I, if I can add, I'm looking at the most recent revised report and there is an increase in traffic exiting onto Ryder Street as a result of the, as a result of the site. And Greg, can you tell me how big that is? So the existing, um, the existing volumes, and again, I'm just, I'm just looking at the, the, the traffic impact report. Um, the existing volumes exiting are three vehicles in the morning, 10 vehicles in the afternoon. Again, those peak hours that um, that Brian spoke of, and then the site generated um, site generated trips are an increase of nine vehicles in the morning and one in the afternoon. And so then the cumulative impact, the cumulative effect is twelve vehicles exiting in the morning, twelve in the afternoon. Correct. But when you just just to add to that, the you know we're um, it's going to be uh, a decrease because currently it's two way um, coming in and out of Ryder Street, but now we're having it um, exit. So although there are uh, nine more uh, vehicles exiting, there's eight vehicles or uh, eight less vehicles entering. So when you think about it, the total number of vehicles on the roadway, there's um, a negligible increase. Does that answer your question? So the yeah, changing, I think so. 
Yeah, so the changing of that roadway from being two-way to one-way is, is what's primarily driving that, even though the outflow, the outgoing traffic will be so, considerably higher, it'll be offset because there won't be any incoming traffic. Yeah, that is an right. accurate statement. Correct. Incoming There's traffic. an increase, increase in exiting traffic, a decrease um, or elimination of entering traffic. And the entering traffic has to come off mass app. Correct. Uh, Mr. Chair. Please. So just to rephrase what Mr. Lucas said, um, there's not a net increase. The traffic is just going in a different direction. Yeah. Um, along, uh, Ms. LaRoyer. Uh, hello, yes, uh, Anne LaRoyer, 12 Pierce Street. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. Um, there is a lot of traffic um, at the intersection of Pierce, Ryder, and Mass Ave, both pedestrian, bicycle, and cars. Um, a lot of students do cross at um, Forest Street um, from across Mass Ave. They don't all go. Um, across at Appleton where the um, school monitors are. A lot of them just walk down part of Mass Ave and then cross over Forest Street, as well as adults and other people that are just, you know, around the area. Um, I, I, there often are problems with um, cars slamming on their brakes to stop for people crossing at the Forest Burton Mass Ave uh, intersection. So that is an area that's of quite concern, um, both in the morning and in the middle of the afternoon from 2.30 to 4, roughly um, when the students are coming out of Audison. It's, it's over a, a spread of time. I think they, the students leave at different times and it seems like it's you know, over quite a long period. Um, the other question I had about um, visitor parking of visitors um, to the the new site, um, they may be assigned to uh, park on Mass Ave, but there is no overnight parking on Mass Ave. So what about overnight visitors? Where are they gonna park? Um, and there, you know, undoubtedly will be overnight visitors there. So that's a question um, that I don't think has been addressed. Um, I'm, I'm still uh, also very concerned about the whole, you know, safety of, both pedestrians and bicyclists in this whole general area. Um, it's kind of a uh, crazy zone. People speed down Mass Ave and they speed through that forest Mass Ave intersection without really realizing what's happening. And there's a turn there. Um, cars have driven into the laundromat on the corner. Um, there have been close calls and one death um, just farther up at Appleton, as you know. So this whole area is um, is a difficult um, transportation site. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just following up on the, the, the question of the Mass Ave crossing, um, Ms. Lynam, I don't know if you know, the, the group that is currently researching the intersection of Mass Ave and Appleton, do you know if that extends down as far as Forest Street? Yes, it does. It does. I know it's called the Mass Ave, it's Mass Ave Appleton Design Review Group, but they have extended the purview of that study. Um, I believe it's all the way to Forest and Lowell. Um, it, and it does include like, it, this entire area. Okay. And I believe they are meeting next week. Um, on Thursday night. And if that is not posted on the town calendar yet, it will be in the next few days. Okay. Because that was sort they would have more influence over issues on Mass Ave than we will have. Um, and then Ms. O'Connor, how, how would the question of overnight guests be handled? We can't, we will not have overnight guest parking. Um, uh, this isn't a hotel, it's a residential apartment building. Um, if people 
stay on Mass Ave and park overnight, you'll get ticketed like anybody else in the town of Arlington that parks um, on a public way after a certain hour. There's nothing we can do about that. So if somebody has you know, relatives in from out of town, is there, what kind of advice can the, you know, can be offered to those residents, to those residents asking what they can do with their, you they know, their can parents. park the car at Alewife and, and go pick them up and bring them to the site. I don't know what else could be done, Mr. Chairman. I know that's what I do when I have guests. I have very limited parking at my house. Mm -hmm. And I know that the town allows for eight overnight parking waivers per year, but it's specific to the abutting public way. Um, but I don't know if that would necessarily apply to this property. Do you have a sense as to whether that would apply here? Um, I, I don't think it would, although the Mass Ave, connect, the Mass Ave connector goes out to Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that would be considered abutting. The property would be considered abutting the public way. The easement abuts the public way. Right. So I, I don't necessarily think that the property abuts the public way. Okay. I may go ahead and forward that question on to the select board to see what their interpretation is on that regulation. Um, and then, yeah, we have, we have discussed sort of how to, you know, how to try to calm some traffic in this area. We obviously have the traffic table at the intersection of Ryder Street and the, the outgoing, um, driveway from the project, but in regards to the other um, the other aspects of, of speed and whatnot in this neighborhood. Um, you know, a lot of that is existing and is not something that necessarily falls under the the, the purview of our review. Um, having almost been hit by landscaping trucks myself in this neighborhood. So um, that's something that needs to be addressed a little bit more by the town in general rather than um, as a part of this process. Um, Mr. Moore, I see you have your hand back up. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thanks. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street, uh, and a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. I, um, I'd like to applaud this developer for the extensive um, landscaping and tree-focused landscaping that this project uh, has, uh, has added. I, had mentioned this before at one of the earlier meetings. Um, this is very much in line with uh, concerns of the town and town residents lately in terms of um, the, the caring about the impervious, uh, impervious surfaces. It was mentioned earlier, I think it might've been by Ms. Contreras or maybe, or maybe it was Ms. Weber, I'm not sure. Um, and, and the fact that they are, are working uh, along the lines uh, of an irrigation system to maintain uh, where possible, maintain the plantings is uh, is is a smart design. Um, I would I would make one suggestion that as much as possible that uh, that the project has uh, large shade trees as the plantings as opposed to small more decorative flowering trees, because um, the this building will of course create a, a lot of reflection of sun and, and light, and the large shade trees should help mitigate some of that uh, in time when they when they grow large. I know it'll take a while to get there, but generally I just wanted to um, um, to give kudos to the folks for having done such an extensive landscaping here, uh, landscaping work here. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, I know Mr. Zick isn't with us. Mr. Connor, do you know, or I don't know if Ms. Krause can address some of the, the tree selection? I, I believe the last hearing when Mr. Moore raised this that Mr. Zick mentioned that they were shade trees and not ornamental trees. Okay. I, I will add that there, there are some ornamental trees, but there, there are a large number of, of shade trees as well in, in the mix, yep. Great, thank you. Are there further questions from the public? 
Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, I, name and address of the record, please. Yep, Peter Maradiano, 17 Beck Road. Um, there's a few things that I actually been uh, thinking about, but also wanted to bring up uh, to the to the uh, board's attention. Um, over on Beck Road, we uh, I know that they have mentioned that they're going to try to enforce um, not allowing vehicles to take a right on to rider leaving the building and then you know making the way down back, but. You know, all it takes is somebody to, you know, if there's a traffic jam, somebody to punch it in their GPS and they're going to say, oh, take it right on back. Um, I know we have talked about, you know, mentioning like, why don't we put up a camera or something or like enforcing that? Um, or why uh, won't the developers allow, you know, the tenants to have identifying markers on their car, like a sticker or something, you know, something so I could say, hey, you know, somebody was driving down back when they're not supposed to be. You know, and it's otherwise it'd be extremely difficult to identify, you know, those, you know, newer vehicles coming down the road and such. So um, I guess my question is, is um, can they provide something like that or have them make the tenants uh, put a sticker on their vehicle or something? Is it um, I, I think we set, told um, the Rider Street residents that we would put up no right turn signs. And my experience is that people generally obey traffic signs. Um, so that, that's what, what we're proposing to do. I, um, I, I work in Cambridge every day and I drive down Mass Ave every morning and I see more people running red lights than I'd like to see. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think it'd be very easy for someone to just take a right and really not care, but um and uh also a part of like the traffic study um has uh, did the traffic study include the dpw vehicles coming and going um sorry uh i'm having a hard time getting off mute um at the time of the uh study when we took the counts there were construction vehicles and landscape vehicles coming down the road so we captured all vehicles at that time of the study does that include DPW vehicles? That includes all vehicles that were on that on Ryder Street. Okay, and then, I don't know if it. I, I don't know if it specifically includes the the temporary relocation of the DPW onto Ryder Street or not. Because they um they they show up in the morning and in the landscaping company in the corner Mazzioli leaves every morning, so there's about ten plus vehicles leaving. Then you've got um, all the DPW uh, trucks, you know, coming and going. Um, so I just wanted to know if those are actually all included because there's seems a, a seems like there's a lot more vehicles leaving than just what was it, fifteen, twelve. In so the, those, the ve that vehicle count was specifically coming from the site onto Ryder Street, not traffic a lot on for other abutters onto Ryder Street. Okay, um, because also we um, I know that you know that the DPW has reclaimed that area, and I guess they're going to be there for about three years. Um, there's now a recycling program that got moved there. I, uh, I had went down there. It was this past, uh, it was May 8th, I believe I went down there and I, um, cause I saw there was a huge traffic jam of cars. There was about five vehicles on Beck road waiting to get into the DPW. And then there was about three vehicles on rider trying to get in. And so there was quite a bit of a traffic traffic jam going on down there. And, I um, ended up talking to somebody down there and they said they expect 240 vehicles every recycling program day. So that seems like a lot of vehicles to be coming up and down those roads, you know, especially on one single day, you know. Um, so I just don't know if this traffic study has per se been, you know, accounted for everything that's really going on down here. I like Mr. Hanlon's analogy about uh, this being the Wild West down here because it really is. There's a lot more going on down here that I would love to discuss that I just won't bring up, but, um, and then, uh, let's see. I'm just, actually, I'm really glad though, to know though that, um, that uh, I don't know if it was niche engineering, but uh, whoever, um, was trying to design the two-way traffic um, when we went and met with uh, Julian Myrak and Brian and Brian uh, gave me some of these graphs that they were uh, uh, trying to show us that uh, now that they realized though that like I've been saying the whole time that the road wasn't wide enough and actually it's, not, it's ironic we were all standing on the corner after that meeting and we saw Mr. Brian driving up the road and he had to stop because another car was trying to pull on and the other car pulling on the rider had to back away to let him out. 
So I'm really glad that that was uh, addressed. Um, but so then, then the fire department came in and said that they're going to have to keep the road wide to be able to support the fire, to support, support EMS leaving, correct? Uh, at least I believe the, the document we saw was for the, the ladder truck. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so, I mean, yeah, I guess uh, other than that, um, I would like the order to be some more, I guess, uh, some, you know, to, I guess I would like to see more enforcement as far as, you know, being able to keep track of uh, tenants, whoever that do take a right on to Ryder, on to Beck, because I just know this is going to happen I'm, because unless the, unless the, is there still going to be a speed table there? Yes, there is. So there's going to be a speed table. Is there any way to put like almost like an edge on the speed table or like an arrow or like a do not enter sign going to the right or something? Because um, like I said, especially today's day and age, I see more people run red lights going down Mass Ave and people don't, people are always in a rush today. And it's just, you're seeing that more apparent everywhere. Um, so to me, safety is very important, but also I'd like to, you know, not see, you know, people take advantage of our area because I organized my neighborhood to have my road, uh, our road repaved and, and it came out of our pocket. And now the town's reusing the area down here and now we've got all this brand new foot traffic. So um, yeah, I guess uh, I'd like to know if there could be anything else uh, further done about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, certainly I would bring your, bring your concerns about the use of the, the temporary DPW facility to the, you know, to the DPW director um, and the recycling team, because that is certainly something they should have in, in mind when they are you know, scheduling events at this location that it is nowhere near as easy to access as, as Grove Street was and will be again. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I have a question for Ms. Lineman, if, if she will. Um, one of the things that is happening here is that everything is happening here. There's a study about traffic at Appleton and Massachusetts. There's a Mill Creek uh, study that's going on. Um, you would sort of have to be a full-time Arlington gadfly to be able to keep track of all of the things that are happening where people are looking at different slices of the problems that this that this area has. Um, we have a very small part in that. The, if this project were to be abandoned tomorrow, most of the problems that we've been discussing would continue to exist. Um, and they have to be solved by the town working together with citizens and various committees. And we have we think of outreach largely in terms of the committees that we have, but we have here at least a group of citizens who are energized and interested in all of the things that are, are going on. And I'm wondering if the town has any way of being able to sort of steer people into the various things that are happening here and to let Mr. T or others who are willing to take the lead really keep up with what's going on. Because the truth is, is that neither the applicant nor the, the board is going to be able to address all this, that it's a town-wide problem that focus, that that has lots and lots of different aspects. And the people who are talking to us need to be talking to others as well to make it work. And I'm wondering if the town has any way to help them do that, to let them know what the things are and when the meetings are taking place or, or somehow create uh, a connection so that uh, the people who are interested can keep themselves informed and influence the groups that are studying the problems that in one way or another are affecting them. Um, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we, I think there are a number of concurrent planning efforts going on right now. Um, the, like, as you mentioned, the design review group for the mass, that section of the Mass Ave corridor has begun. Um, they're studying it right now. I haven't attended those meetings, so I don't know exactly where they're at, but I do think um, I'm happy to put the residents in touch with um, Daniel Amstutz. He's our transportation, uh, senior transportation planner, and right. he is our contact for that group. Um, 
there are other planning efforts that are going on. So we are just embarking on a housing plan. Um, I would love to add the residents from this area to the contact list. We're conducting focus groups and we have a planning event. We have an event coming up on June 9 about that plan. Um, we also are starting an open space and recreation plan. And there's another event on June 10 for that. So uh, there are different events that are, there are different planning efforts going on. And then as, as I mentioned, the Minuteman Bikeway study, which is going to cover the entire length of the bikeway. Um, that's another plan that, because we are just putting out an RFP, we don't have a consultant or a plan or a timeline for this project yet, but this, these are all sort of concurrent things that uh, getting directly to residents and getting feedback from residents on these plans is always a challenge. Um, and I'm always happy to talk with community groups and, and inform people on when things are coming up in the process so they can participate either remotely or in surveys or in actual community events. Um, I had one other comment that I was gonna share and now I'm sort of losing my track of thought. Oh, the one other mention, thing I wanted to mention is that we do advertise all of these things through the town notice email system. And if so if people are not, um, find, now again, that's a very passive way of getting news out about these things. But I do, I would encourage everybody to sign up for the town notice email system because that is how we, that is another way of sharing when community events or planning events and planning processes are going out. Um, so I believe you can go to the, if you go to arlingtonma.gov and under connect, you can sign up for email subscription lists and then town notice emails are an option. That is a really good way of doing it. And we also promote all of these things on the town's Facebook and Twitter accounts as well. Um, but I will put my email address in um, my profile picture here. So if somebody, if a number of residents from the neighborhood wanted to reach out, I'm happy to make sure that we reach out to you um, as these different events are happening. Great, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. Um, just uh, to piggyback on uh, what Ms. Lindman had to say, I would also suggest folks uh, take a quick review of the annual report. Um, the annual report just gives sort of a general focus of what various committees and groups and, are doing. And of course, the focus is looking backward. However, they often talk about plans for the next year. So it's, a, it's not a bad one-stop shopping kind of place to get info. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Contreras? Hi, um, I mean, I, I appreciate what Mr. Hanlon just spoke to um, and asked um, to, to for us all to receive more information about that. Um, I don't think that the ZBA and the applicant have a small part. I don't think this is a small part. I think what is really determinable for us here is that this is an influx of 120 plus units. And I don't know how many people that will be. My guess is somewhere in the range of 130 to 300 people who then become residents. But then I'm my concern is that we've only talked about residents. We haven't talked about what is proportionally the appropriate accountability and responsibility of the developers or the people who own those units because we're just talking about residents. And so, you know, we're, I know that, you know, Ms. O'Connor's like put us in touch with various people, but I'm very concerned about the longer term responsibility and accountability measures that as an abutter, I can't, I can't hold the, the, these developers too. I can't hold, you know, when people sort of misbehave at nine rider, that's only like 20 units or so. I can't, I have no power to, to do anything about that. And so on this private way, it just, it's really concerning to not have the applicant thinking through the experiences of the daily life and traversing of their tenants and their tenants guests and the people who will be visiting the sites and the abutters. 
we've heard so much about car traffic. It, it does not matter if, it only matters if they greatly reduce car traffic here and they're not going to be able to do that. I'm really concerned about the status quo not being acceptable and not being safe. And I have not heard in an appreciable way like how they how the developer how the applicant has thought through the experiences of their tenants their tenants guests the delivery services the the caregivers for the young and old who come and have to park somewhere during the day their work bar tenants and the community members who are visiting the new corridor and i think that's just that is something that is still really not sitting well with me not just as an abutter I am here at my window every day worrying about people I do not know um, when I probably should be worrying more about some things that are under my control. And so I, I just that that's my plea at this point is that I really want to have people walk. I want to see the developer walking through here and asking us questions on the ground about the experience at this unique ecology because it's not safe right now. It's not going to be safe when they put in 120 units. And that is of deep concern. We had a death occur a block away from here. It's, it's, this is just not, it's not, it's so serious. And I, I'm just hoping that the board can assist us in addressing this concern. It is extremely local. I mean, I can't, it's, it's 400 feet. It's so local. Um, Thank you. I really just want to express my concern here. Thank you. No, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Are there other public comments at this point? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment for this evening. So moving forward, um, the next time we would be gathering um, would be Tuesday, June 1st. Um, would like to ask the board sort of, of the issues that were raised this evening and things that we have seen um, up to this point, where, where are the points that we need additional input and uh, clarification from the applicant um, in regards to you know, helping inform us about what we would want to and need to include um, in a possible decision on this project. Well, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I've been sort of impressed by the discussion that we've had tonight about guest parking. Um, and with all due respect, I, I don't think that if you're in Arlington Heights being told that you can park at Airwife and have somebody come get you is a completely adequate answer to that. And we're looking for limited parking here on site. And uh, I would like to, the applicant to at least think a little bit more as to uh, another way of, of dealing with the guest parking. I think that many of the people who commented tonight know in their hearts exactly where the guest parking is going to be and it's not going to be at Alewife. And, uh, you know, it's the town who, that with their, its overnight ban that kind of creates the problem, uh, but that ban has been there for a long time and is likely to stay there for a long time. And I just, you know, when we're looking at giving parking waivers and, and getting the parking down, I think having zero consideration for guest parking um, is 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 not very realistic and I, I hope that that some more thought can be given into given as to a reasonable way of accommodating that concern. Thank you. <clears throat> Members of the board. I know from, from my perspective, I know um, Ms. O'Connor's gonna think I'm a broken record here, but the, 
the utility poles that are in the rights of way. Um, that, the, that to me, those are sort of the, the things that really make me concerned, um, especially where we are going to be, you know, increasing volumes on these on these uh, interior roadways. I just want to, yeah, I know you're working with Eversource on making the poles more visible, but I would like to see um, some more information about how how they're going to be made visible and how they're going to be made more crash-worthy, um, both in terms of the utility pole and in terms of the um, you know, the vehicles that possibly could be impacting them. Um, and I did like the uh, uh, there was a recommendation about the speed table and possibly the the surface of that reinforcing the the left turn only. Um, so I think it'd be good to see. And I had mentioned before the um, adding some additional. Uh, painting to the pavement in areas where there's to be no parking um, to help reinforce that there will be no parking in those areas. Um, you know, I have in my notes to, I'm gonna reach out to, um, to Michael Rademacher, who's the, the head of the DPW um, in regards to some of the issues that were raised this evening to make sure that they're on, um, that he understands them and also, um, that the, the recycling and how that is impacting the local uh, residents. Um, and I'm also gonna reach out to the select board to ask about the, the overnight parking waiver and whether that would is something that would be um, allowed for use by the residents here to park on Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, there's one other note here. Those are the ones that I had on my list. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, one of the things that I think we, <clears throat> that we need in, uh, is a revised and pretty near final waiver request. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to June and the executive order that allows us to be meeting like this uh, is set to expire, is my understanding, on June 15th. Um, and we are now down to the point where, when we go back to the beginning of the meeting, there were not very many points of controversy uh, that were left between our experts and the experts retained by the applicant. Uh, and I think that we need to begin thinking about an end game here. Uh, and it would be nice, I don't know if it's possible, but it would be nice to be able to uh, finish up a little early so that we don't have to go into the uncertain era that is going to happen uh, sometime immediately after June 15th. Um, I don't know if we're in a position of being able to say that June 1st is our last meeting, but I think we should all be thinking that we're now pretty much near the end game and it's time to begin thinking about how to wrap everything up and uh, and put this to the point where we can close the hearing and the board can then take its as much of the 40 days it has to actually render a decision as um, as it needs. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, Ms. Krauss? Uh, Chairman Klein, sorry, I just wanted to um, bring up that uh, we have not received responses from the applicant to our April 13th letter. Um, so although the traffic and civil and site design comments have all been resolved, there are still some um, wetlands and regulatory comments that remain outstanding. Um, and they weren't discussed tonight, so they didn't come up in conversation, but I just wanted to bring that up now just to ensure that we we, they were discussed at the last ZBA meeting. Um, we, I think the applicant verbally addressed a couple of them, but we haven't received anything in writing. So um, there still remain a few outstanding comments. Okay. Ms. O'Connor, can you follow up on that? 
Yes, I will. I thought there had been a response, but I will follow up. Thank you. Um, let's ask uh, Mr. Haverty, are there other considerations that we should be exploring in the next two, three weeks? Not that I can think of, Mr. Chairman, um, but we obviously are going to have to get going on starting a draft decision, which I will do, but I don't think I'll be able to have it ready for June 1st. And, and Ms. O'Connor, as, um, as Mr. Hanna mentioned, uh, just the, the final waiver request. Yeah, I'm working on that now, Mr. Klein. Perfect. Anything further from the board that we want to make sure we get wrapped up and uh, reviewed in the next couple of weeks? I am seeing none. Um, so with that, um, would we'll entertain a motion to continue tonight's hearing on 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue to Tuesday, June 1st, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revlack. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Mr. Chair votes aye. So we are continued on 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue to June 1st. Um, and then before we close for the evening, I just want to uh, review the list of upcoming uh, meetings that and milestones that the board has in front of it. Um, so next Tuesday, May 25th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, will be the first hearing for, I believe it's 83 Palmer Street. Um, and we have a continued hearing for 34 Marathon Street. Uh, now Tuesday, June 1st at 7.30 p.m. will be the continuance of 1165 RMSF. Uh, Thursday, June 10th at 7.30 p.m. will be the continuance of Thorndike Place. Um, and then Friday, June 25th is currently the scheduled closing date for a public hearing on Thorndike Place. And Friday, July 2nd is the closing date for the public hearing on 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I believe those are our only dates. Um, Rick, are you aware of any other upcoming dates? We have nothing uh, pending, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Perfect. So then with that, um, I would like to thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting, especially wish to thank uh, Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Lanema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's reporting of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town dot arlington dot ma dot us that email address is also listed on the zoning board of appeals website and to conclude tonight's meeting i look for a motion to adjourn so moved thank you mr hanlon have a second second thank you mr revlack mr dupont aye mr hanlon aye mr. mills aye mr o'rourke aye mr revlack aye mr ford aye Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much for all your Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mrs. O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See many of you tomorrow night at town meeting.